to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, and uh, as we prepare to enter into our second session of the evening, let us pray. Father, as we convene tonight for our second session, we lift up Paul Nugent and his landscaping business to you, and he is in need of another helper And uh, we pray that you find just the right help that will be suitable for Paul's business. And uh, we pray that you would fulfill that need and prosper Paul's enterprise. And we pray that as we undertake this second session, you would continue to illuminate your word through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans chapter 11, that's where we left off last time. We've been studying the, the uh, who, what, where, when, why, and sometimes how. That's important for uh, every story, every Every complete story will have these essentials addressed in some way. And we've just been comparing. Well, we haven't compared yet, but we're going to contrast the who, what, where, why, when, and how with uh, the body of Christ and Christ's return for us in contrast with Christ's return to the earth to set up his kingdom, which we commonly call the second advent of Jesus Christ. Now, we looked in Romans 11 and verse 11. That's where we'll pick it up from. Romans chapter 11, verse 11. So I asked, did they stumble, that is the Jews, in order that they might fall, that is fall permanently? Did they stumble temporarily that they might permanently go down for the count. By no means, rather through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now if their trespass means riches for the world, and it does, that's a fulfilled condition, How much more will their full inclusion mean? Or literally, their fullness mean. That is their fullness in the future under the new covenant. Back under the prophetic program. So, as I mentioned, this was never prophesied. This time in which the Gentiles are blessed through Israel's temporary stumble never prophesied. The prophetic plan has called for the the Gentiles to be blessed, but for the Gentiles to be blessed through the prosperity and the blessing, the fullness of Israel, which will take place in the future under the new covenant. You can turn uh, to Zechariah chapter 8 with me. It was always prophesied that Israel would be a light unto the Gentiles, that Israel would be an agency by which God would be made known to the Gentiles. But Israel as a nation always fought that principle and never was really, sometimes more than others, but never was fully that light to the Gentiles that God would have her be. But she will be in the future. In Zechariah chapter 8, let's look at verse 23. Zechariah 8 verse 23 Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, this is speaking of when Christ establishes his kingdom, 
In those days, ten men from the nations of every tongue shall take hold of the robe of a Jew, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So Israel in the future will have her fullness under the covenant program. Let's go back to Romans chapter 11, that same area, just the following verses. <coughs> Roman, <coughs> excuse me, Romans chapter 11. And Romans 11, verse 13, right after the verses we've covered, Romans 11, Verse 13, now I am speaking to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order to somehow, in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, and it does, what will their acceptance mean? That is, if her temporary rejection by God, if the, the temporary rejection by God of the Jews means the present reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Just as the, the illustration of the, the vision, actually, of the, the uh, valley of the dry bones being restored from the dead that Ezekiel received. And... Israel's future glory will be a receiving of life from the dead, meaning Israel is temporarily, spiritually speaking, a, a, a spiritual non-entity, spiritually dead, as it were, but will receive spiritual life under the new covenant. You can turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So what we just saw in Romans 11 is, is part of the why of the story of this event where Christ returns for us. And... 1 Corinthians 15.50 is part of the why. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. This is part of the why, because, because our bodies as they are now are, are unable to withstand the eternal state. The how has been answered in both First Thessalonians 4 and here in 1 Corinthians 15. The dead will be raised first in 1 Thessalonians 4 and then the bodies of those who are still living, those believers who are still living, will be changed. And we have that right here in uh, the B part of verse 52. Let's read the entire verse, 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we will be changed. And what happens then? God wages war on this planet. And God 
raises up, God judges Israel for Israel's sin of rejecting God, but God also saves a core of evangelism within Israel. And many of those who are uh, eternally saved will also be physically uh, remain physically intact as people are saved through this core of evangelism, and some of them will remain physically intact. Re- uh, Matthew 24, verse 13, to enter the millennial kingdom, which will begin at the second advent of Jesus Christ, which is an entirely different story. And we'll deal with that story right now. We'll, d- we'll deal with the who, what, when, where, why, and how of that story. Turn with me to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. We'll start at verse 1. Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 1. In the first book, O Theophilus, Theophilus was a person Luke the physician was writing to, probably a a well-to-do believer. In the first book, O Theophilus, I dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit, to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. What was the promise of the Father? the baptism of the Holy Spirit, whereby Christ would baptize with the Holy Spirit. In Luke 24, 48, they were instructed to wait for that promise. Or at least, I'm not sure of the verse, but at least the end of the chapter. So, uh, in verse 4, And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Baptized with the Holy Spirit by Jesus Christ. So when they had come together, verse 6, They asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? What did it mean to restore the kingdom? Isn't he going to establish his kingdom? Isn't his kingdom already in shambles? Yes, but it will be restored in the sense that the Davidic dynasty will be restored as Jesus Christ, the son of David, occupies the throne of David in Jerusalem. He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when his when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Epi, upon you. What will happen? You'll receive power. Special endowment for the Pentecostal era. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, not when the Holy Spirit has baptized you into Christ's body. That event was not written about until years later when the Apostle Paul wrote about that. About, uh, let's see, 30, 40, about 25 years later, actually. Now, in verse 9, 
or verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. What message would they witness? What message would they proclaim in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth in the prophetic plan? Well, the, the message of the coming kingdom, the message proclaimed by John the baptizer, the kingdom from the heavens is near, the prophesied kingdom. And by the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 4, verse 17, the kingdom from the heavens is near. What, what, what message was this? The gospel of the kingdom, which was preached by Christ and by Christ's apostles. The gospel of the kingdom, called the gospel of the kingdom, Matthew 4, verse 23. When is it going to reach the end of the earth? It hasn't happened yet. When, it was going to, when is it going to reach the end of the earth. It happened in, Ju in Jerusalem and Judea. They reached down into Samaria with it, but then it was gradually shut down. When it is, when is it going to reach the end of the earth? In Matthew 24, verse 14, during Daniel's 70th week, and the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a witness to all nations. Then the end will come. That gospel message is going to be picked up during Daniel's 70th week. That's not our gospel message. We teach it from the pulpit. We don't proclaim it. We we may mention it. It's true that the kingdom from the heavens is the next. Uh, it's going to be the next chain of prophetic pro prophetic fulfillment. But that's not the message we preach. We preach the information of the cross, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18, the logos, the word of the cross, which is one and the same with the logos, the information, the word of reconciliation in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19, which is one and the same with what Paul uh, called the gospel of the grace of God in Acts chapter 21, which is one and the same with what Paul simply called the gospel in Romans 1.16, which contains the power of God to save everyone who believes and wherein is revealed the righteousness of God out from faith and into faith, that is, out from saving faith and into a life of continuing faith. And the gospel, which Paul in three places in his writings calls my gospel, using the first person singular pronoun, in other words, Paul's gospel, the gospel revealed directly to him by the Lord Jesus Christ in Galatians 1, verses 11 and 12. So, Acts 1, continue with verse 9. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, and these are obviously angelic beings, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come 
in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. How is that? He was taken up in a cloud. How is he going to return? We'll look at that in Matthew 24 momentarily. But he's going to return in the same way uh, to earth as he was on the earth and ascended. Not to meet believers in the clouds of the air. He's actually going to return to earth to establish his kingdom. From the same place he took off. In, in, in fact, the very same place uh, when you consider verse 12, then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. So Mount Olivet is where they were when they saw him take off and go into heaven. And if you want to uh, look at me in Zechariah chapter tw uh, 14, Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14. And we'll take it from verse 1. Zechariah 14, verse 1. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord. This is the day of the Lord spoken of, uh, which will occur late in Daniel's 70th week and usher in the second advent of Jesus Christ. Was spoken of by Amos, by Obadiah, by Isaiah, uh, by uh, Jonah, or Joel. Uh, by uh, others as well, Ezekiel, I think, was spoken of a lot in the Old Testament, major prophets and minor prophets. Behold, a day is coming for the earth when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst, for I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses plundered, and the women raped. Half of the city shall go out into exile. He gives instructions to those going into exile in Matthew chapter 24. But the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half southward uh, by extrapolation. It's not out of bounds to assume that he'll actually be touching down on the Mount of Olives, the very place from which he ascended. And he'll be touching down the, 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 uh, the Olivet Mountain or the Mount of Olives, that's, that's what it means, is going to actually be broken in two as he touches down. There will be great cataclysmic changes. We take those to be literal, uh, at least we who believe in a, a literal hermeneutic, uh, and there will, be, there will be cataclysmic changes upon the earth. Uh, it only makes sense because the conditions during Christ's reign on earth is going to be uh, conducive to a glorious 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ. So uh, where 
and how are being answered by passages such as this. A different where and how from when he meets us in the clouds of the air. No, he's going to come touch down on earth from where he lifted off to establish his kingdom. And every eye is going to see him. It's not going to be an event where where we're going to be caught up for a meeting. It's going to be an event where every eye is going to see him. And he is going to return in the same manner as his disciples saw him take off. You can go with me to Matthew chapter 24. This is where we'll conclude tonight. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Let's just start at verse 3 where he had a discourse on the Mount of Olives commonly called the Olivet Discourse because it was on the Mount of Olives. Very appropriate that it was on the Mount of Olives because he was talking about his return and what would happen before his return. This is all about the manner in which he will return in the second advent. And it's about Daniel's 70th week. There's nothing in this at all, nothing in this chapter that is about the gathering, the called out gathering of Christ's body, the the ecclesia to which you and I belong. This is all back on the prophetic calendar. And he was speaking to people who knew nothing about this mystery entity, the body of Christ that would be formed and that that would uh, cover an interim of time, a gap of time in the prophetic program. In Matthew 24, verse 3, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. And we have a section then that begins to answer what will happen. What did they ask? What will be the sign of your coming? And of the end of the age. Verse 4, And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. That is physically rescued. He's about to give instructions when people what people are to do in Jerusalem when they witness the abomination of desolation we don't have a lot of time for this but we've covered it many times but what what are the Jews to do at the time at which the abomination of desolation will occur they're to flee the city quickly And the one who endures to the end, that is the end of the age, which they understood to be 
uh, the end of the age in which they lived, and rightly so. Paul even understood that don't confuse ages with dispensation. Ages are time periods. And the same age that, that the Jews and Jesus thought of as the present age in which they lived, Paul the Apostle thought of as the present age in which he lived and we live. The age preceding the age to come, which will be the, the age of Christ's kingdom on earth. But the one who endures to the end of the age... The age of the age preceding the kingdom age will be saved, that is, delivered into Christ's kingdom physically intact without without being killed, to put it bluntly. So we begin to have uh, the how. Look at, at uh Start at verse 29. Just reading some parts in this. We don't have time for all of it. Starting at verse uh, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. In case you were wondering, the recent eclipse was not the fulfillment of prophecy. But these things will be. Verse 30, Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. They wanted the sign of his coming. In verse 3, tell us, when will these things be, and what will the sign of your what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And we have the sign of the Son of Man. What is the sign of his coming? The Son of Man himself returning to the earth to establish his kingdom. That's the sign. When they see him return, that will be the sign of his coming. And how is he going to be coming? On the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. How did they say, how did his disciples see him go into the heavens on a cloud? You say, well, that was cloud singular. This is clouds plural. Okay, you got me. I don't. Uh, to, it's similar enough to me that uh, uh, it's okay. This this describes the the this describes the how and the who and the what and the where. All the content we're reading and the why. And he will send out his angels. Uh, well, wait a minute. Let's finish. Verse 30, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. And here's another another uh kind of they people misconstrue this trumpet call with the trumpet with the last trump or or trumpet call in 1 Corinthians 15 that trumpet call in 1 Corinthians 15 is that occurs just as the rapture happens this trumpet call will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other, which is a figure of speech for another way of putting it is, is the four corners of the earth. In other words, his people are going to be gathered from all directions. They are going to be ga gathered from the God in heaven and from the angels who are working uh, 
uh, the elect angels who are working with the God in heaven and God's elect Israel will be brought back into the land under the new covenant. Verse uh, 32, from the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will not pass away, but my words will not pass away. And, and uh, of course, the, uh, uh, the preterist who wants to think of all these prophetic events as already having been fulfilled at the judgment of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 will say, there, look, this generation, that is the generation to whom Christ was speaking. No. So also when you see all these things, you know that he is at the very gates. Did the generation to whom Christ was speaking see all these things? No, they did not. What generation is not going to pass away until all these things take place. The generation which sees all these things. They just didn't know yet about and had no reason to know yet about the fact that there was going to be this interim of a mystery dispensation that's now gone on for for roughly 2,000 years, and who knows how much longer it'll go on before the prophetic plan kicks in again. Verse 36, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. And then it goes into the two uh, that we've gone over quite quite a lot, two working in the field, two grinding in the mill, in the, at the mill, one taken in judgment, the other left to remain to go into the kingdom. But the son in his humanity, his deity, of course, knew, we always, we've covered this in different places from the Word of God. You, when Christ is saying things about himself, you always must understand that statement either has to be coming from his deity, from his humanity, or from both in his hypostatic union. But when he said in John eight fifty eight, before Abraham was, I am, that was obvious, obviously from his deity. In his humanity, he came into the human race in, in human form after Abraham was, long after Abraham was. So that statement was from his deity. When he said on the cross, I thirst, that, that's clearly from his humanity. Deity doesn't thirst. When he said, come all to me who are burdened and heavy laden and I will give you rest, that really can only be said from both his deity and his humanity. When he said that, that no one concerning the day and hour that he returns in his second advent, at the time he was speaking, no one knew not even the angels of heaven, nor his own humanity, nor the Son, but the Father only. Does his humanity know now, his glorified humanity? I would, uh, if I was a betting man, I would wager that his humanity now knows. But when he said this, his humanity didn't know. Yet, by the time Matthew wrote this, but now Matthew was quoting what Christ said. 
before the kingdom was ever offered, because it was never offered until Acts 3, verses 19 through 21. But by the time Matthew wrote this gospel, which was which could have been as early as the 60s, it could have been later, it depends if you go by the, the two-source hypothesis, which, which is just that, a, a hypothesis, a supposition based on limited knowledge, and I won't get into the details of that tonight, but that, that supposes that the gospel of, of Matthew and Luke were written with material from the gospel of Mark plus material from what they call Q, which was a, a um, like a sayings source, and that's why the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke have so much m- more material in them. But they don't know. It's a, it's a hypothesis. It's possible. Matthew could have written as early as the 60s. But we do know this, that by the time he wrote, and if he wrote during the 60s, it, it would make sense because he would see what was what had already gone around him he understood that the kingdom, the, the time of Christ's second advent had been deferred to some future time, that it was likely not going to happen in any of their own lifetimes. Because in verse 15, when he writes, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, Standing in the holy place, he has in parenthesis, because he is breaking from the quote of Christ, and he's saying, let the reader understand. Then he goes back to what Christ is saying, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So, Matthew recognized that the time of the establishment of Christ's earthly kingdom had been deferred by the time he wrote the gospel. He was quoting Christ, broke away for a little parenthetical statement of his own, then back to what Christ was saying during the time of his earthly ministry. And so we, we get, uh, as, as far as the who, where, what, when, why, and how, uh, the information, all that information is addressed, and it's very clear, it's addressed in the, the New Testament, and it's very clear in this information, and from places in the Old Testament, but it's very clear from this information that there are two separate events. The gathering whereby we meet the Lord Jesus Christ in the clouds of the air and he doesn't come down to earth. And then the time of his second advent, approximately seven years after that, where he will touch down on earth, on the Mount of Olives in a manner as the apostles saw him take off in Acts chapter 1. And let's close with prayer. Father, thank you for what you've given us tonight and every session. We thank you for the clarity of your word and that you have seen fit to reveal your Son to us in very specific terms. Help us always to be open to those terms through which you reveal him to us because we get so much of a greater picture of your integrity and his integrity as we get more clarity regarding these events. And so we pray with thanksgiving in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.